Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, what a great uh, honored uh, presentation we have tonight with uh, uh, Dr. Souza. He's uh, he's a uh, <coughs> investment economist. He's uh, an advisor at Pillar Six Advisors in San Francisco. And I don't know if you had a chance to read his bio, but it puts certainly myself to shame with all his certifications <laughs> and uh, credentials. Uh, he's uh, had has over 26 years in experience in commercial real estate and financial services. He's written dozens of, uh, of um, whether they be books or, 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 or material on, on the subject matter. Uh, he, he most recently, I think it was in 2011, the Fundamental Economic and Business Cycle Analysis. If you haven't read that, please do. He's an, uh, uh, a surfing aficionado. You might find him out at Mavericks watching the <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> you're here to take us on that big wave into 2019, Dr. Lawrence. Oh, Pacers. thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate the invite. and It's really great to be here. And, big, big fan of accountants and attorneys and economists and I'm kind of like a, I don't know, what do you call those, a, you know, fans, you know, the people who follow people like around, a groupie, a groupie <laughs> there you know, you go. I just have a tre tremendous amount of respect for uh, what you do and, um, you know, the world wouldn't work if we didn't have accountants, basically. And I do teach my students that the, the fundamentals pretty much of uh, all institutions and all cultures are really based on the accounting, both managerial and financial, and you have to really understand the accounting, both the managerial and the, fa and the, and the financial, and then you build on top of that the, uh, the finance and the econ and the political science and the public administration and the law uh, and philosophy and, 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 uh, and theology. So really, the, uh, the accounting is really the, the basis of the, of, the, of the foundation of the culture, in, in my view. Um, so just so that you know kind of where I'm, I'm coming from, I have uh, multiple master's degrees and doctorate degrees. Um, I really focused on the finance, even though I do have an accounting degree. <clears throat> but my focus was really on the finance, but I started off in, in economics. Um, and then over the years, particular, particularly after the financial crisis, um, I really relied on my public administration, my political science degrees and backgrounds, because I really needed to try to find out the origins of the financial crisis. And I couldn't find really the, uh, the origins of the financial crisis uh, from the accounting or really the finance literature. I mean, it was too narrow. Uh, although the, uh, uh, the discount rate determination and the volatility in the discount rate uh, really did give me an indication of the volatility in asset price bubbles and, and collapses. So everything's really embedded in the cost of capital and in the discount rate and the volatility in that, and I'll go over that in a minute. But I felt that the finance literature was a little too narrow. So then I had to rely on my economics background and, and really look at the uh, monetarism and Keynesian theories and really put that into a uh, political economic context. And that really opened up you know, my eyes to the reality of the situation and really what leads up to these asset class bubbles and collapses is really the adoption of uh, political economic ideologies. And you can really see the political economic ideologies being battled out between the two parties, the Republican Party, that's really adopted the uh, monetarist view of the, of the ide economic ideology and the Keynesian view from the Democratic Party. And uh, the, the parties, I would say, over time were fairly centrist. Um, so the, uh, the political structure between the two parties were in the center, so they could get a lot of policies done that actually would have major impacts on a broad base of the, the population. But unfortunately, over the last 10 to 20 years, the two parties have basically fragmented and gone to the extremes, not necessarily the left or the Democratic Party, but definitely the Repu Republican Party has moved to the extreme right um, of the extreme, and I'll go through that uh, also too. And then the conclusion really was it, it, it became a game theory, um, where it was a winner-take-all scenario, uh, where the two parties would basically battle out economic ideologies on the extreme in a winner-take-all scenario. Um, and you really saw that. Um, 
probably five, six years ago, um, when the <clears throat> when we were de debating the budget and the budget was held up and we and basically sent us into a mild recession, you know, in the uh, summer of 2016, it was really back then. Um, and so that really opened up this battle of these ideologies with winner take all game theory with a prisoner's dilemma type of outcome, which was I thought uh, fairly scary. Um, and then the uh, the financial crisis, I, I came to the conclusion that the, the financial crisis basically started with the uh, passage of the uh, Dodd Frank Act, which basically repealed the Glass Steagall Act, which basically deregulated the financial. Uh, institutions to allow them to basically manufacture derivative contracts and then to basically rack up off balance sheet uh, liabilities in the trillions and trillions of dollars that then eventually when everybody figured out that the uh, house of cards was uh, basically ready to collapse and when it did collapse unfortunately the uh, it cost us probably on the fiscal side about uh, five trillion dollars uh, from my estimate maybe eight trillion dollars on the fiscal side to re-stimulate the economy and it cost us about uh, five trillion dollars on the monetary side because we printed about five trillion dollars on the monetary side so about ten trillion dollars uh, it cost us from the financial crisis and if you go out and you guys totally understand this because most of that um, cost was financed through debt or some kind of debt financing with, a, with interest rates on it so probably over the next 30 to 40 years, it's probably going to be about triple. So the total cost was probably around $30 trillion over a 30 to 40 year time period. And when I basically have these di discussions with my students, they have no clue. And they get really scared when they basically know that we're going to be running about a, a trillion dollar deficit and maybe more per year uh, due to basically self-induced, self-inflicted, um, uh, in my, my view, basically immoral you know, and unethical behavior by our politicians and others within uh, my industry. Um, so that's kind of a precursor to what I'm going to lay out. And uh, I'll go through, um, is there anything right now, I'll take kind of a survey, is there anything that you would like me to focus on? Because I'll move pretty quickly through the slides, it's fairly comprehensive, but is there any one or two things that you would like me to focus on as I go through the presentation and that way I can uh, add a little bit more detail or a little bit more depth, you know, into the analysis. Could be interest rates, fiscal policy. Um. Maybe it's too narrow, but I am really, you already touched on it. You discuss it with your students. Mm -hmm. The debt. And yeah, I have all that. I have all that. Lots of good. Because I have that. I'll talk about, I'll talk about the implications. Just, and I'll even use uh, uh, Japan and some other countries that have basically exactly. printed trillions of yen to basically prop up their economies, and they've been in recessions for Does almost 20 years. Come? Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you think in the near future, the U.S. dollar, the international, will abandon the U.S. dollar? Because so the new, the last dollar, normally in the past, the U.S. dollar, the better to combine with the oil. But I think the European, and the euro and Russia to abandon the U.S. dollar, right? When we talk about it, that does in the near future, we one day, the yeah, I could, I could talk about, you know, other competitive currencies and the potential for a debasement in the, in the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency and, the, and the, basically the means of international exchange. I can talk about that, but I don't really see any currency basically supplanting the U.S. dollar at this point. Um, just because of historical um, uh, establishments of the U.S. dollar as the medium of exchange, which was basically, and I'll get into it a little bit, which was basically the negotiation that we made with the Europeans after World War II. We would basically use the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency to, do, to conduct all international transactions, which would keep our cost of debt extremely low based on comparative pur purposes on an international basis. In exchange for that, we would provide the security for the world okay, in a capitalistic democratic um, society. Although a lot of that's been uh, unwinding uh, fairly recently within the last two years as uh, President you know, Trump has basically tried to dismantle a lot of the institutional arrangements that we've set up and worked for over the last you know, 80 years post-World War II. So I'm not going to you know, bash Trump, 
that I'm going to be a political scientist and I'm going to use my institutional analysis to basically be critical, you know, of some of the institutional deconstruction that I, and destruction that I've, I've identified, uh, all the way back to really the Bush administration, but it's just accelerated over the last two years under a, a president that really is not aligned with the post-World War II arrangements that, I, that I've seen. Mark, Mark Lai and, and his whole philosophy of austerity and whether, you know, I can talk about austerity. I mean, you know, Jeff, the austerity. And yeah, the sure. Region, you know? Sure. And uh, I'm just curious to see if you fundamentally agree with this as you go through it. I mean, you're talking a lot about this. Yeah, so yeah. I'm doing kind of a primer right now. Yeah. Uh, but I'd say that uh, to get to your point, and I'll get right to your point, is I really think what's happening in Paris right now is, a, is an example of that. Where in, in other parts of Europe, you know, in Spain and Italy and Greece, where they basically have racked up so much debt um, through fiscal expansion with really no multiplier effect, no really stimulus. Um, and the problem is, is, is now because the banking system was so impaired in political instability um, and they racked up all that debt, that the, uh, the EU, underneath the Germans, obviously, have basically imposed requirements for austerity in those countries. And that's basically lowered uh, living standards there. And what you're seeing in Paris right now is you're seeing riots, OK? Because they have to raise the taxes to pay you know, the interest on the debt and to keep the debt con conservative. But by raising you know, gas taxes, created riots in Paris. And you'll probably see more of these social uprisings and maybe even revolutions or riots going forward and more populism uh, on a global basis because a lot of the people through these austerity programs, they're seeing their social welfare states. They're seeing education, healthcare, and housing. Basically, the funding being debased. And at some point in time, like what happened in Paris, they raised the, the gas tax, basically added an on average 800 euros to each uh, person in France, 800 euros. So if you're on the margin already, uh, going into poverty or living on a subsistence level, and you just got a bill for another 800 euros, it's like a thousand bucks a month that we would have to pay here. They be, that basically wiped out um, their their standard of living, and they and they basically rioted. And you'll probably see more of that stuff um, because a lot of these countries are over debted. Um, they have a lot of you know interest on the debt. They haven't really seen the economic growth that they otherwise would see, because I really believe that the financial crisis has permanently disrupted a lot of these economies and a lot of the economies in the United States. That will probably never recover. So you're probably going to look at more populism, and you're probably going to look at more uh, social and political unrest on a global basis. Yes? I'd be interested if you got more of a micro level. I'd be interested in, in the, the Bay Area. Real estate investment in California. And yeah, I can do area. LA. I can do the Bay Area, and I can do probably multiple, uh, uh, probably the four core property sectors. If you want to get into, you know, investment opportunities and where I think we are in the commercial real estate cycles, and what investment sectors I would probably, and what markets, you know, I would probably focus on. And I do actually have that at the end of this presentation, you know, where I picked. You know, the sub-markets, you know, uh, in which I think if you're going to invest in real estate, those are the, the sub-markets I would invest in, okay? So any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I didn't fully really follow the connection between the financial crisis and the government debt. Okay, so... So the financial crisis occurred, right? We went into it basically a severe... The housing bust, right? The housing housing. Yeah, because the, what happened was leading up to that, because of the deregulation from Dodd-Frank, in 2000, signed, signed by the Clinton administration, it was basically a 10-year process of deregulation. Okay. So the financial institutions were basically uh, lending on mortgages to bad credit, subprime, you know, and then they were packaging up those. But these are all private companies. What's no, these the are large. Multi, these are the large money center banks and all the banks that were basically lending these private, mortgages private on this collateral to the credit, bad credit. And they were basically inflating the housing uh, prices through this excessive credit, you know, that eventually led to the boom and then to the crash. What does he have to do with the company? What? What does he have to do with the company? Because we bailed them out. It cost us $10 trillion and $30 trillion over a 30-year period. On a global basis, the financial crisis probably cost us $90 trillion. We don't have any okay. more money. Okay, but the economy has recovered since. That's correct, but what about the next one? We don't have any fiscal capabilities because we're already maxed out on the sovereign debt. 
the Fed is sitting on basically a four or five trillion dollar balance sheet. It had a, a balance sheet of two hundred fifty billion dollars for basically thirty years. Now the balance sheet is five trillion. They're unloading thirty to forty billion dollars a month. They're going to go to ninety billion a month by the end of next year. It's going to invert the yield curve. The yield curve inverted two days ago. It inver inverted in April. Every time the yield curve inverts. Uh, basically, the stock market peaks in less than 12 months, and we're in a recession in less than 24. You can go back 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. The yield curve is probably one of the most accurate predictors of the recession. It has everything to do with the government, because the government basically deregulated the system. And I hate to say it about the, the accountants, uh, because FASB was the one that basically um, imposed the mark-to-market -market on the assets that were sitting on the bank balance sheets. Mm -hmm. And then when the assets were being written down, it wiped out the equity of the banks. And the banks went insolvent, and basically FASB rewrote the, uh, the, uh, the, the cost basis and allowed the banks to hold the loans and the assets on their balance sheet at cost basis. Because if they didn't do it, uh, we would have had runs on the bank. And we're lucky we didn't have runs on the bank. And the banking system of the top five banks were basically nationalized, although they don't talk about that. So basically, they swapped out uh, trillions of dollars of bad CMBS and RMBS bonds that were sitting on the balance sheet. They basically froze the loans at cost basis on the asset side of the balance sheet. Since the debt ratios basically are fixed you know, across the maturities of the bonds, it wiped out the equity. Basically, the, the banks, uh, the, the government came in and bought the convertible preferreds, and preferreds are, are considered equity. So it made the equity ratios look better. And then they basically um, uh, stabilized the banking system, again, swapped off the bad bonds with treasury securities, and basically put a Band-Aid on the system before it actually collapsed. And if you were watching it before the system, it basically, government is supposed to step in and cure capital market failures. They did cure capital market failures, but it cost us 10 trillion bucks. <coughs> uh, to his point, or to yours, you, you know, you said somebody said, "Well, the, the economy is bad. We saved the banks, but we didn't save the people That's on correct. the other side who had the mortgages." That's great. And it's capital versus labor, in my yeah. view. I mean, we basically bailed out the banking system. We but printed we five bail trillion. Out people who lost that That's capital. correct. I mean, the the Obama what was the Jobs Act was about eight hundred billion yeah. to basically re-stimulate the economy on the labor side. So the banking system got six trillion. The labor market got one. Okay, so it's it, it's just it's pol politics, right? It's easy to bail out the banking system because the banks and the investment banks have a direct lobbying. They're, they they're the biggest lobbying group in Washington. So they basically control the policy. Labor unions labor unions have no no power anymore, and basically labor has no pol power either. So it's got to come from some political party or some kind of interest to basically advocate for the labor markets and for labor, and I just don't see it in Washington. I just don't see it. So any other questions? I hope I, did. oh, I didn't mean to attack you or... or no, I have a discussion. Thank you. Okay. You're, yeah, we, we should have some you know, debates. Any other questions or anything? Yes? You know, my, my concerns about the fact that we just, um, the Republican House, you know, we, lo we lose a lot of... Um, in Washington, D.C., it's going to be two years, it's going to be flip flop. So the agenda of our uh, president is not going to be able to go through. And you see today, the Dow Jones had lost almost like 450 when they opened the market. Yeah. And the, the trade war with China That's and the rest of the executive. That's correct. You know, so it's going to really shake the market. It's a very That's unstable correct. for us right now. That's correct. So and and my theory is, is that, um, well, when, when investors are analyzing the intrinsic values to be able to make investment decisions, uh, when they are determining the expected returns of the discount rates that they are applying to get the intrinsic values to be able to make those net present value positive or zero decisions, that they, when you're building the discount rate, what I think every investor takes for granted and doesn't add onto the discount rate, the risk premiums, they do not add policy and political risk premiums. So I think a lot of the volatility that you're seeing in the equity markets is mainly driven by volatility in the discount rates, driven by political and policy uncertainty <coughs> and risk premiums. And there was a, a, a about a year ago, uh, Goldman Sachs did a survey 
uh, with their uh, fixed income uh, investors. And the fixed income investors basically said that their biggest concern right now was policy and political risk premiums. You, you never really hear that. So it basically means that discount rates are more volatile now. And actually, the Federal Reserve has basically masked a lot of those risk premium volatilities by basically driving interest rates to zero through over-accommodated monetary policy. Now that they're unwinding, there's convulsions in the capital markets due to excess supply now of, uh, of, of government bonds being sold back into the marketplace as cute quantitative tightening starts to come. And as the Federal Reserve starts to raise short-term interest rates, the marketplace right now is forecasting a recession. And that's why the 10-year Treasury yield has dropped so much over the last two weeks is because the market is anticipating lower inflation expectations to an anticipated recession within the next 24 months to 36 months. And I've been forecasting a recession between 2021 and 23 for over five years. And I can show you the uh, data that basically shows that there's a 90% probability of a recession in the first five years of every single decade. And if you start to impose polit political uncertainty and policy uncertainty along with trade war issues, because China's economy is shrinking very quickly, um, that is also going to have a major impact on GDP going out in the future. And the market's taking that, uh, that impact of the trade war into consideration going out over the next 24 months. So I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Any other? Just an observation. Yeah. It absolutely mesmerizes me when you can stand there and and you have such a broad understanding of something that every day is hard for me to even grasp. Um, I mean, you've been studied it. For, I, I'm trying to give you a compliment. No, thank it's you. amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry for this to sound like it's amazing, and it's. I, I'm just congratulating you and all everybody in what you're doing. There's so many pieces of it that go so together pieces. to draw a conclusion. That, it's so many pieces. And so. my world is so small compared to looking at things on a much larger macro basis. Well, thank you. Anyway, please your presentation. Yeah, I'm, try I'm, just, I'm trying. I'm very impressed. <laughs> just, yeah, thank amazing. you. I'm, I'm trying because what I. When I initially set out in my career, uh, in my 20s, as I was working the dirt parking lot at Candlestick, <laughs> and I realized I didn't want to be a parking lot attendant the rest of my life. And I had one of those brilliant economists as my professor, and I wanted to be like him. And then I realized that you know the accounting you know degree wasn't going to allow me to be able to answer a lot of these questions. So then I, ma I ma migrated into finance, and I felt that that was limiting. Too, and then I migrated into economics, and that gave me a little bit more perspective. But it wasn't until I started studying political science and public administration that really gave me a policy and political view of the things and how really that systemic and systematic risk coming from the top mm -hmm. really does have a major impact all the way down to the micro level. And you almost have to incorporate chaos theory because you don't know, you don't know what you don't know on that, on that last no, piece of it. No, and we're all, we're all educated to basically focus in certain areas you don't have time to you know get all those degrees but I felt that having a, a behavioral science background you know and integrating all of those together right. gave me a clearer view and then I've just been practicing communicating it over the, over the years thank you so I'll, I'll, I'll try this so let's keep going so I'm not making any recommendations I'm not an accountant attorney. I'm an investment advisor I have to give my disclaimers okay um, and then uh, I always have to, you know, bring my cat in because you know he's cute, and, uh, and he ate my uh, he ate my kittens' um, food and he went bald, which was like totally hilarious. Oh my god! Yeah, and he didn't grow his hair back until like years later. But uh, he's a, he lasted for 22 years. So. Oh wow! So. Yeah, he's fine. So this is my this is what I wrote in 1996 when I really started. Uh, uh, teaching and really kind of bringing it all all together is efficient efficient real estate and security capital markets require strong public and private sector cooperation disclosure of government and corporate financial conditions and institutional and individual investor confidence in both the financial and political system if you have a violation of this you're going to get underproduction you're going to get misallocation of resources you're going to have underemployment you're going to have lower falling real wages, and you're going to have a low and falling standards of living. And if you kind of look at the United States over the last 10, 20 years, 
have we been violating this? I mean, poverty rates are up. Uh, mortality rates, I mean, our, our uh, life expectancy is down by two years just the other day. Um, you have, just drive around Oakland, you have tent cities. So yeah, there's, I, I see, the, I see the, uh, the violations here. And if you use this as the hypothesis to basically analyze other countries, it really does kind of, uh, you test your hypothesis against this. And it really does, I think, uh, tell the true story of what's, what's really going on not only domestically, but globally. You had asked me to talk about, and I could spend you know, hours on just this slide, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. On a global basis, and not only the battle between you know, Trump and Clinton and what's happened with the Russians, and you know, that, the populism in the United States. Um, you have uh, Canada and basically the uh, antagonism you know, over NAFTA between Mexico and the United States, which has basically redrawn the supply chains. Um, on a global basis, you have the Brexit, Brexit populism out of the UK. I don't know if Theresa May is actually going to make it, but Brexit, I think, is a total disaster. It's a totally self-made, you know, infliction. They're going to lose their competitive advantage that they gained over the last five, seven hundred years as basically the global finance center. And basically, Fran Frankfurt doesn't care. They're saying, bring it on. We'll take care. We'll clear all your derivatives. Uh, Paris will take the, the business. Um, the U.S. will take it, Singapore will take it, Tokyo will take it. Um, it really is uh, unfortunate, I think. Um, and then Angela Merkel, I'm very concerned. I mean, she basically has given up her party representation. She's going to be the prime minister for a couple more years. Um, I think uh, when uh, she goes, um, uh, Germany, which has been an anchor to the European Union for uh, quite some time, if there's a populist, some kind of populist parliamentary take over there uh, away from the center and away from their corporatist uh, policies over the last 50, 60 years, that could be completely un unstable, I think, for Europe too, which um, Europe is very unstable right now, especially the, uh, with Greece and Spain and Portugal and some of those countries that have very high debt levels. I mean, if I were them, I'd bail out of the, uh, the EU and the monetary system and I would basically have our own currency so that they could devalue their currencies to basically create uh, uh, import, uh, you know, capital flows into their country so that they could export by devaluing their currencies because now they're pegged to the euro and they can't export enough and they have very high debt levels. So I'm not sure how long the EU uh, will act actually last. Um, and then you have uh, what's going on in Italy. They've already had a banking crisis. Um, they have a constitutional crisis. They got a political crisis. They all already had runs on the bank. Uh, in Greece, Greece is a basket case with their austerity programs, their banking crisis, major corruption within their banking system and political system. Um, you have Spain. I really don't know what's going on there, although they've been in a recession for quite some time. Uh, Russia, do I need to say any more? <laughs> and there's a list, right? Yeah. Crimea, the hacking, um, uh, you name it. I mean, it's unbelievable what they're doing right now. They're meddling. Yeah, they're doing that, everything. Uh, Turkey, I mean, uh, Tayyip Erdogan has basically already uh, uh, issued martial law. He incarcerated 100,000 people. Um, he basically shook up the, the whole institutional arraignment and now kind of brings up some question about, you know, will they even be able to maintain a secular military state um, in Turkey, which is one of the uh, anchors uh, of uh, the military, uh, the union bordering basically the Middle East, which is extremely unstable. And Turkey is actually the conduit for mass immigration into Europe. Um, so you, and then you have uh, you know, other issues there. Um, you have uh, Abdel Fittal el-Sisi in Egypt, which is basically a military dictatorship that took over um, the, uh, uh, the spring you know, uh, there that was, was, was a chance at basically democracy there. That's basically been, been quelled. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia, total disaster, <coughs> total humanitarian, <coughs> total disaster, and now you, and basically uh, Syria is a proxy war in a post-Cold War situation between the United States and the Russians, yeah, basically. Uh, and it's a disaster, I mean a total disaster. Uh, Libya, failed state, Iraq, failed state, Afrika Afghanistan, a failed state. <coughs> Uh, just read uh, Noam Chomsky's work on failed states. Uh, Pakistan, um, borderline um, failed state. 
Um, you have India, Modi, that's probably one of the best stories that they've seemed to be able to maintain their political democratic system. Um, and the, uh, the economy seems to be uh, uh, growing fairly well, although under Indira Gandhi in India, they basically were the model case for using, uh, pitting the, the, the sheiks against the uh, Muslims, using race and religion to basically divide and create uh, uh, political outcomes as opposed to policy outcomes. And I think um, Donald Trump basically took the textbook from that because the Gandhis basically played uh, the Muslims against the Sheikhs in a, in a racial religious that really benefited them from a political standpoint. A lot of what you're seeing now, history repeats itself. It's a textbook, and the politicians basically read the textbooks. And if you understand history, you can see it play out all over again. Uh, Latin America with um, Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador, who just got voted in, I think it was this week or last week. He's a little bit more uh, leftist and will real, real, really be interesting to see what happens there because obviously the renegotiation with NAFTA and the immigration issue and with the Maquila Doras, which are basically the supply chains that supply a lot of the auto parts in the United States. It'll be interesting to see you know, how Mexico responds, but you have major issues in Mexico. It's extremely lawless, a lot of criminality, a lot of murders, a lot of gangs, a lot of drug trafficking coming in uh, through Mexico. Uh, Brazil, uh, Borderline failed state. It used to be a, a, the jewel of Latin America. Um, it was basically a model for export-oriented economies. Uh, they've had major political uh, unrest, political corruption. Um, its economy is actually shrinking right now, so it's not really the, uh, uh, the case uh, uh, now. Argentina, hyperinflation, political instability in Latin America. Um, Southeast Asia, China, under Xi, you know, the Belt and Road is a major policy that uh, Xi wants to push through. And now they are basically using their money to build infrastructure in Africa, in Asia, and other parts of the world to basically supplant the U.S. influence and U.S. Uh, domination over the uh, political, economic, military situation on a global basis. China is becoming extremely aggressive that now that the United States is pulling back from their post-World War II institutional arrangements, China is more than happy to step in and provide the military and provide the capital to basically provide now, now uh, weigh influence uh, in the emerging markets. The only problem is they are a communist country. We're a democratic co country. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of political pressure that China puts on some of these countries um, because they're not democratic capitalistic models. Um, you have uh, Hong Kong, Singapore has had some issues. We know about North and South Korea, what's going on there. Um, Australia has actually held up very well. They haven't had a recession in like 20 years. So they've actually, um, are, I think, a pretty good model. Um, South Africa, under Jacob Zuma, the uh, ANC, now Cyril Ramaphosa, the ANC was extremely corrupt. Uh, they basically brought, uh, took money. They basically gave it to their cronies. There was no housing, no health care, no education. That was provided to a lot of people. And really, it, it's, a, it's kind of a disaster in Nelson Mandela's uh, uh, history. And then the economic indicators we look at is really GDP, industrial production, interest rates, employment, wages, commercial real estate asset prices. And then um, there's obviously strategies around that too. So that's kind of a global perspective. I just see, you know, dismantling and deconstruction of the post-World War II uh, institutional arrangements that we basically had in place, uh, where we were the model. Um, now it's, we're basically moving away from democratic capitalism into populism um, on the extremes. And that's just, if you go back to World War I, uh, where you had basically nation states competing against each other um, in, uh, uh, you know, extreme ultra uh, political positions, um, what you end up having is the nation states compete against each other and at some point they go to war. So the, the uh, probability of war at this point in time post-World War II is probably the highest it's ever been, particularly with the antagonism with the Russians. The Russians are really on the borderline, um, could drive us into some kind of uh, regional flashpoint. And the German and the Ukrainians asked the Germans 
to basically provide the, uh, uh, some troops. They've asked for NATO support. The Russians already have 86,000 troops on their borders. And it's really, really, in my view, a very uh, precarious uh, position okay, that, that could turn out pretty bad. So this is basically the way that I look at it. Um, I built this model in 1996. And it, I basically, the question was, how do I forecast the value of equity, the directional direction of equity? It could be my human equity, my, my stock portfolio, my real estate portfolio. How do I forecast the direction of the value of the equity? And the answer is, it's not one equation. It's not an accounting equation with accounting variables. You know, the, the regression equation that you can forecast, you know, the value direction. Obviously, accounting does have insights into what drives values up and down, but you really have to look at the finance uh, also, the finance literature, the finance institutions, the, the variables in the finance model, the economic models, the political, public administration, political science, and legal. We live down here. This is where I lecture my uh, real estate um, colleagues. It's really easy to underwrite present values from pro formas using discount rate sensitivities and projections of NOI or some kind of cash flows over a holding period with the terminal value. But what really affects the values these days is really the politics and the policy that's being implemented through the institutions and the bureaucracy that will have a direct and indirect economic impact on our value of our equity. So we really, this is easy to underwrite. I, I challenge my colleagues to become political scientists and start to forecast if certain individuals or certain parties or certain compositions of the government start to unfold, what are the probabilities of certain policies being enacted? And then are you in the path of negative or positive externalities associated with those policy outcomes? And if you're in the negative path of these policy outcomes, you have to have contingency plans in place. You gotta be able to hedge it. You gotta sell your assets or buy puts or write calls if you use derivative contracts. And if the policy outcomes look like you or your clients are gonna benefit, you need to move into the path of the benefits of those policy outcomes and leverage the positive aspects associated with that. <coughs> so we are you know, all trained in accounting and finance and economics, but we really have to train ourselves in political science, policy, and public administration, and expand our, our view of things. And I think if you do that, it'll become so much clearer exactly what's going on, and who's going to benefit, and who's going to get hurt based on these policy outcomes. And then us, you know, as financial managers and accountants, and consultants, have to advise our clients, and take care of our family, and take care of our clients, and be proactive, um, and do the right thing you know, from an ethical and a a moral standpoint. So I wrote this right after the financial crisis in 2011. Um, I spent about a year studying the financial crisis and the origins and the aftermath. And this was the conclusion that I came up with. I came up with a couple that I think this was the, the most compelling. What I found out was over the last 95 years, society and the economy have witnessed great, great prosperities, wars, depressions, recessions, and revolutions. We have just witnessed a revolution in political, economic, ideological thought. We moved from Keynesianism to monetarism. And in its wake, institutional deconstruction, destruction, and market failure. The question is, what social, political, and economic institutional synthesis will develop from this aftermath? And we're only 10 years into it. Uh, and how will history judge us as, as a generation? And how will we be remembered? And I tell my students, we're probably the worst generation. We basically bankrupt, bankrupt our kids. We've left them a, a worse situation, environmentally, fiscally, and you know I just have to be honest with them. Um, and I feel really bad about it because I don't think we did do a good job. <clears throat> the other thing that I, I noticed too was that, and this was really written um, after the uh, 2001 and the uh, aftermath of the 9-11. And what I witnessed was a systematic deconstruction of the Constitution of the Bill of Rights. And I'm seeing it again now over the last two years. And you can just see it. You can see attack on the media. You can see attack on individual rights. You can just, I mean, the list just goes on. And my, my synthesis from this was I wrote, and based on um, 
postmodern philosophy. I, I read a lot of Nietzsche and Heidegger and Arendt and, and them. And I came up with this um, conclusion. Institutional deconstruction is the dismantling of pluralistic and democratic institutions by powerful interests in, within society. The goal is to deconstruct these institutions and repla replace them with new authoritarian institutions that enforce and redistribute private property rights to privileged interests at any cost. If you just see what's going on, you can totally see it. You can see it. And it was being done, you know, after 9-11, it's being done again. And what I noticed is when it was done back then, in 2001, uh, we were in a severe recession and a potential depression within less than seven years. So if the same thing's going on now, there's a high probability of another uh, financial crisis at some point. It usually starts, you know, you start to see deconstruction of social, cultural, political institutions first, and then it leads into some kind of capital market failure at some point down the road. So I think very far out, because I can see the trends coming. So after I did the research too, I said, well, you know, what, what was the origins of the financial crisis? How did it, how did it happen, okay? So what I did was I basically, I studied a philosopher called, uh, Fred, uh, Frederick Hegel, um, and Hegel was very in influential in Marxist um, when he uh, wrote Das Kapital, who was basically the first business cycle economist that basically looked at institutional re restructuring within economies and then the implications and ramifications on society and the economy. So I basically said, okay, I think Hegel's on to something. I mean, I've done uh, cycle analysis to be able to predict recessions, but nobody's ever looked at it from a dialectical standpoint. So I basically went back and retraced out the dialectic, and I noticed that the dialectical shifts over time, you know, from aristocracies and dictatorships, you had the wars and the revolutions, you had this Keynesian democratic, um, you know, institutional framework that became the antithesis of the new institutional framework of how the world actually works, and then it was we basically made the transition pretty. Uh, smoothly from democratic capitalism into this adoption of some kind of neo-Cold War global capitalism. That became the new synthesis, which ran all the way up until 2007. We basically threw away the Keynesian uh, model and adopted monetarism and deregulation as basically the institutional framework that led to the financial collapse because we basically deregulated the banks. The banks basically manufactured a contingent liabilities off balance sheet. And then once everybody realized that the debt ratios were way too high and there wasn't enough money to service a lot of that debt, it basically collapsed the system. And the financial crisis, in my view, was basically analogous to a world where it cost us the same amount of money and I think almost the same amount of people have actually died from the after effects of the financial crisis. The question will be is what will be the dialectic? What will it be like over the next 15 to 30 years? The, the financial crisis occurred in 2008, and we're in, what, 2018. And I, what I found out is these dialectics last, on average, 30 years. So we're about 10 years in, into the first 15 years of the 30-year dialectic, which means you're going to see more institutional realignments uh, going on on a global basis, and you're already seeing it. In capitalism, you're seeing it. In democracy, on a global basis, there's being a realignment between the relationship between governments and governments, governments and corporations, governments and their citizens, corporations and their consumers. There's a realignment going on. What does this have to do with anything? Because I, I advise pension funds, and they look out their liabilities and their assets are 30 years. So they need to be looking out on an institutional basis out 30 years to be able to understand the dynamics that are gonna impact both their liabilities and the asset performance to be able to fund the pension fund liabilities that are gonna come due at some point in time. So it's just a different way of looking at things. Um, if you look at uh, public choice theory and the mean voter theorem, I basically went back, took the mean voter theorem and retraced out the right which shift in political economic ideology that has basically occurred over the last 80 years. Roosevelt basically cemented the Keynesian leftist social welfare state that the United States had to basically cure the uh, market collapse and the financial collapse and the social and economic collapse from the depression, which was basically man-made through speculation, through deregulation 
of the financial institutions. This seems to be a recurring theme <laughs> uh, that I noticed. And then you saw this rightward shift start to occur. And what was really fascinating was that Clinton basically moved his, Repu his Democratic Party right of center to, to capture basically the moderate Republicans, refashion the Democratic Party as the progressives to basically capture the election, okay? Because there was always a rightward shift, which I thought was a brilliant um, a democratic and political move. And then uh, what you also saw was you, was you saw Bush 1, Bush 2, Bush 2 was basically a, uh, was, uh, enabled through Fox News. Um, you also see uh, with Reagan, he came in through the introduction of cable TV. So you're seeing basically a leverage using technology and the media to basically push political and economic ideologies to the masses to control the politics. If you survey the population, they are center, they are centrist. If you survey the voters, they are right of center. Now with social media, Twitter, Facebook, all of these technologies, Obama I think did a really good job of enabling those technologies to win the election, and I think uh, Donald Trump was brilliant in his uh, use <coughs> of the media end of technology and now enabled, I'm not saying anything until, you know, the, the court case is done, yeah. but the Russians were involved and other uh, countries were involved using Facebook and using the technologies yeah. to basically manipulate the population to vote in a certain way, okay? And that's kind of the reality. So now what we do is we basically have, you know, a president under, you know, the Republican House and the Senate on the extreme right basically controlling an economy and a population that wants to be right of center. And the best policy that's ever enacted historically is when you have the parties very close together in the center, basically building public policy from the center that's gonna have the biggest impact on the majority of the population. The policies right now are not doing that. They're basically, uh, there was some research done recently that of the uh, <coughs> 1,500 policies that were enacted, that the majority of the policy outcomes were basically specifically targeted to a certain class or a certain group, not to the majority of the population. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the map, this was the outcome from the uh, presidential elections. And these are the richest, the coastal states are the richest, which are mainly high population areas that are dominated basically by Democrats. Um, that's not the way our democracy works, it's not, you know, pluralistic in the sense that it's based on population or popular vote, it's based on congressional districts. And the congressional districts were rewritten in the 2000 census um, by the Republicans to basically gerrymander, to be able to have a, a political um, advantage um, to be able to capture um, election, electoral districts. And it's gonna go to the Supreme Court to see if some of those electoral districts will actually be uh, rewritten. This is, this is political economic reality is, is basically um, the, I'm going to probably go through this just as quickly as possible, but the election was really interesting, if, and I'll give these slides to you. If you look at really the psychographics and the demographics and who voted and who didn't vote, um, this was the first time that actually race and religion and other the, of the, a lot of those factors were really actually used in a modern context to, to win an election. Uh, the election was so decisive and the aftermath was so decisive that uh, psychoses, neuroses, and pathological behavior were actually emanated. You should have seen my universities when I was at Cal State San Francisco, when I was at Golden Gate in St. Mary's. There was Muslim students being harassed. There was women being harassed. There was people being harassed um, at the universities. I've never seen anything like it in the 25 years that I had been there. The behavior was just was horrible. It was just appalling. And this is just the reality that we're working in. And there is an economic impact. Um, Trump has basically implemented most of the policy agenda that he laid out on, with the tax cuts and the military spending, uh, deregulation of you know, the financial industry, uh, immigration policy, uh, climate policy, uh, trade. You, you, you can see he basically hit on everything, and he's basically systematically dismantled a lot of the pluralistic democratic institutions and regulatory oversights that have been put in place over the last 50, 60 years. Okay. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. What'll be really interesting is the emoluments clause. 
because um, basically they're, um, when the Democrats come in, they're going to go after his trust and they're going to go after his nonprofit. Uh, and we kind of have a, a belief that um, he was using both of those uh, to basically conduct business, not only prior to the election, but also uh, while he's been in office, which is, a, which is the violation. You can't be doing business out of the White House, okay, as a president. And I think some of his policies that you see um, have basically been politically and business motivated. It's not based on ethics, you know, or morality. Um, if you go back and you look at overall wealth in the United States, and this is my biggest issue right here, is the, basically the, the fall in social welfare and overall standards of living in the United States. This is the average uh, wealth of, the, of a household. It started at $80,000 in 1992 and basically peaked out at 135 in 2007, we're back to 80. Okay, so basically we've gone backwards. So unless you were in the upper 90th percentile of the income spectrum, you did fine. But if you were in the, you know, the other 99th, bottom of the 99th percentile or 90th percentile, you probably saw your wages stagnate, wages probably fall, and your net worth go backwards in real terms after being inflation adjusted. So that's an issue. And that, the only way to address that is through policy. Well, excuse me, but that's the financial crisis right there. You can see the, the asset bubble. Uh, yes, that's correct, but you're back to where you are on an inflationary basis, where the uh, top 90th percentile has actually benefited the most. most. So if you're in the bottom 50th or 75th percentile, you've gone backwards. So overall, the majority of the population has not seen an increase in standards of living or social welfare since basically 10 years. Okay. That's why you have populism in the United States, because people are not feeling the wealth, okay? and they're desperate. Okay. Um, if you look at the financial institutions, they're almost as leveraged as they were prior to the financial crisis. I look at the, the, the amount of derivatives exposures, and I looked at the uh, derivatives to total assets. So there's 18 times notional value of the assets of the banking institutions. So if we have another financial crisis and the derivatives need to be bought out and cleared like, it, like they were after the financial crisis, there's no more money to clear the system. There's probably like a thousand trillion dollars of notional value in derivatives that are currently outstanding in the system right now on a global basis. Who's gonna clear those trades? Where's the money gonna come from? How do you bail out the system again? You don't, you can't. Okay. That's, my, that's my biggest one. And there's more systemic risk too, because most of the financial institutions now post financial crisis are even more intertwined and interconnected than they were prior to the financial crisis. Dodd-Frank was supposed to break up the banks and to disintermediate and diffuse the interconnections amongst the banks to reduce the systematic and systemic risk. That's not happened. And if any one of these clearing houses, let's say the CME or some of these clearing houses, like Lehman did, and I'm worried about Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank goes down, and Deutsche Bank is horrible. They have the worst balance sheet, the worst financial ratios. The stock price just dropped below 10 to 6. Uh, they have major debt ratios. I think they're insolvent. Um, Germany and the EU are going to have to bail them out. If not, they should do it now, in my view. Because if Deutsche goes down, it's like a Lehman situation. Because there's so much interconnectivity, they all clear through each other. If one of the clearinghouses go down, it's going to take down the system again. That's what keeps me up at night. <clears throat> and then just uh, overall corporate, personal, and government debt levels. We're more leveraged now than ever before because they drove the interest rates to zero. Real interest rates negative. In Europe and in, in Japan, they drove interest rates negative. Um, so everybody basically went to the trough and over levered. Levered up at basically uh, very low interest rates and issued massive amounts of bonds. Now the corporations did not issue bonds and invest that money in capital to basically produce per, uh, some kind of perpetual income stream or to hire more people or to invent new product or to expand their production facilities. What they did was use the cheap debt to buy back their debt, their, uh, their stock. Basically reducing the number of shares outstanding and propping up their stock price artificially from an accounting standpoint. And why would they do that? Because the majority of the leaders in the corporations have stock options. So if I can issue the debt, you know, which is easier, and I basically buy back my stock, I can inflate my stock price, and I can get my stock options in the money, and then exercise them. 
and the tax cuts that just went through, I don't see the money going into investments and in plant and equipment and new product development. They took the money and they basically bought back the stocks to prop up their stock prices even more to give them an exit um, with their stock options. The United States is not a corrupt system at all. <laughs> Uh, and then there's, the, there's just more and more debt that's coming. We're looking at basically $1.2 trillion of structural deficits going out to the eye, as, as far as the eye can see. From the tax cuts especially, we were already looking at another $10, $10 trillion over the next 10 years. And if you add in the entitlement programs to basically pay for our Medicaid and Social Security, um, I don't know where the money's going to come from. I really, do, I really doubt where it's going to come. The, the critics uh, basically say that the United States is, is on a, a path of its own financial self-destruction because they just, uh, Washington just continues to spend with really no uh, view on fiscal conservatism. And the, and the Republican Party have, has basically thrown out fiscal conservatism, and we knew that the Democrats threw that out a long time ago. So basically you're looking at uh, massive sovereign debt issues and the Fed's unwinding their balance sheet. Who's going to buy all that paper? They'll buy the paper, but they got to buy it at a higher interest rate. And that's actually going to drive up the interest costs on our debt, which will just perpetuate itself in a, in a situation. And the majority of the debt is owned by um, Asians and, and the Saudi Arabians, uh, particularly China. China will buy our debt to basically uh, buy the dollar, to prop up the dollar, to devaluate their currency, to create a comparative advantage in the, uh, in the merchandise uh, trade system. So they're more than happy to buy our debt. But if they ever unwind the debt and start to unload the debt, which they actually have started to do over the last two years, that's going to put upward pressure on interest rates. Uh, and you, just, you can see just the ac accumulation of the, of the debt. You can see the interest portion on the debt. Okay. This becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you listen to Kyle Bass, I don't know if anybody listens to Kyle Bass. He's from Hyman Capital Management. He only made like a quarter of a billion dollar shorting uh, mortgage-backed securities after the during the financial crisis. He basically said that uh, Japan will probably default on their bonds um, because at some point in time there's going to be so much bond issuance and there's not going to be enough tax revenues to pay the interest. So eventually they're going to default. So they're conducting unorthodox monetary policy. And I think we might be going down that, that road too. Because at some point in time, the interest on the debt could be as high as a half a trillion to maybe a trillion dollars a year at some point in time. At some point, the interest is just taking up more and more of the discretionary budget. And we know that uh, defense is not going to get cut. And other parts of the economy is not going to get cut. So they're going to have to go after entitlements. <laughs> they're going to have to go after social welfare, welfare <coughs> pro programs at some point in time. Uh, and here's the entitlements. So we're basically right here, right, in a, in a entitlements that are going to go to here in 2031. Because okay? we're all getting older and baby boomers are getting older. We're going to start pulling the, from the system. And it's about uh, 80, $83 uh, billion in 2007 to $1.3 trillion by 2025. Where's the money going to come from to finance this? It's either going to come from higher taxes or some kind of cutbacks in, in entitlement programs. And I thought the tax. I thought taxes were going to come from, I didn't think we were going to get tax cuts. I thought we were going to get tax increases to basically mitigate this financial situation. And the corporate taxes would be the perfect place to go because total corporate taxes, tax revenues as a percentage of GDP over the last 10, 15 years is at an all time low. So obviously corporations are not paying into the system. They're circumventing through corporate tax loopholes on a global basis. And then you're seeing China now, um, since the United States, you know, as a global percentage of total GDP is starting to shrink because China is starting to increase along with the emerging markets. So I think that's going to be our biggest competitor going forward. And it'll be interesting to see how the partnership between uh, China and ourselves uh, actually work out. China is basically, de we are basically dependent. We're interrelated now, especially here on the West Coast. We are totally interrelated particularly from the tech standpoint, because we source all of our components from China. And there's high velocity of capital, human capital, and trade between the West Coast and China. We're facing Asia. So it's a different dynamic. And I think there's an opportunity uh, there also. I also worry about China debt. 
and I'd speak in front of a, a lot of Chinese delegations. They come here, they ask me to speak, they ask me to talk. I talk to them about the, um, the massive amount of debt um, that they have. Um, they are more than happy to print uh, money through their central banks to buy debt in their government-owned corporations to basically prop up the bond prices and drive down uh, the cost of debt and the cost of equity to prop them up. Um, actually, the, the Chinese government has actually started to unwind and pull back a lot of the excess credit within their economy, which I think is prudent. Um, but I do think that there is probably a debt bubble in China, and if China goes into a recession, then these corporations on a massive basis start to default on their bonds, um, then a lot of these companies will go bankrupt, and there could be uh, major issues in China. And if China goes, we'll go too, okay? Because we're so inter intertwined right now, um, economically. Um, in 2016, 14, 15, 16, there was massive capital flows coming out of China. You probably saw them. You probably saw the money come in, particularly into real estate, because it's easy to bury uh, a half a trillion or, a, sorry, a 20 billion, uh, 10 billion, a billion, you know, into portfolios of real estate or, or large construction projects in New York or Chicago or Boston or LA. A lot of that money came in. And in 2016, there was about 680 billion or over 600 billion that was coming out of China because people were scared of the devaluations, the inflation and political instability in China. And we were more than happy to take the capital. Um, in 2017, the Chinese government basically imposed uh, capital controls and increased the underwriting standards of the capital that was coming out to be invested in, in real estate and in uh, step tech startups. And actually you're seeing some Chinese investors start to liquidate some of their positions currently here in the United States to redeploy that capital someplace else on a global basis because they believe of rising interest rates and uh, asset price bubbles in the commercial real estate markets that now might not be a bad time to basically liquidate their real estate assets. So we're gonna probably see, we've seen the capital inflows you know, shrink significantly and we may even see some capital outflows within the next couple of years, in my view. And these uh, foreign governments um, can, uh, basically own at least 34% of our sovereign debt. So they kind of control to a certain degree if they're not trying to peg their currencies. Um, they have a, a significant control over the uh, sovereign debt in the United States. And they were liquidating the debt, which was putting upward pressure on interest rates. Um, but the Fed was right there to print the money to basically buy the bonds back to keep interest rates low to continue to stimulate the economy. And here's the liquidation of the, of the securities, but not only by China, but also net uh, foreign liquidation of Treasury securities. Is, when interest rates go back up again or when interest rates peak, you'll probably see uh, capital flows coming back in to the United States. Actually, our interest rates have been well above. Uh, global interest rates, which has basically brought capital flows into the United States, which has propped up the dollar, which obviously makes imports cheaper, which has held down, down inflation, but makes our exports more expensive and actually has a direct impact on GDP uh, from a growth standpoint. Uh, tax policy, I know you all know about this and where the, uh, uh, where the stimulus is coming from, but there'll be some negative effects uh, um, cost of spending, some positive on consumption and saving, definitely uh, buybacks. I haven't seen much dividends from corporations um, and investment from private companies. A lot of that is basically assumptions uh, that are going on. And then here's the uh, percent of GDP to, or total uh, corporate tax receipts to GDP. And you can see over the last um, 50 years that uh, total tax receipts from corporations are historical low, they've gone lower, right, after the tax cuts. And I thought this would be the perfect place to basically go after new tax revenues to, to fund, hopefully, social welf welfare programs such as education, housing, um, uh, health care, or maybe I'm just too liberal. Maybe I think the government should raise taxes and redistribute into public goods instead of just private goods. I'm r really not convinced that private markets are really the best form to uh, distribute public goods on a mass basis. They should be partners, but I don't think they're the main mechanism. This re research I thought was really interesting because I really thought that the, uh, the party, you know, when the Republican Party controlled the House and the Senate and the executive branch, 
that the first thing, instead of attacking and trying to dismantle um, the uh, Obamacare, they should have gone after infrastructure, which would have been brilliant as opposed to tax cuts because they lost a lot of political capital. And if you look at the multiplier effects from infrastructure spending, they're extremely higher than through uh, supply side tax cuts. So infrastructure spending would have done a better job of stimulating the economy than getting more people into the labor force. Yes, unemployment rates are at historical lows, but labor participation rates are at decade lows. So the unemployment rate is not the best measure for labor participation, it's labor participation rates. And I really think that it shouldn't have been tax cuts, it should have been infrastructure spending. And we know who, who benefits from the tax cuts in most uh, standpoints. Um, infrastructure. And then when you do tax cuts at such a, a late stage in the business cycle, um, the stimulus effect is a lot less at the late stage than if you were doing it in the early stages of the recovery phase of the business cycle. So tax cuts you don't use as pro-cyclical, so late stage within the, within the business cycle. So again, that's kind of a, another policy mistake. And tax cuts really don't have an impact based on the research on long-term after-tax equity returns. Investors are gonna invest. They really don't look on, on a tax basis. Um, they've really pegged their after-tax expected returns at roughly 12.7%, and it's been like that for decades. So really tax policy doesn't really have an effect, in my view, in a really stimulating uh, capital into uh, equity investments on an after-tax basis. It's really what is the total return or what's the return on the investment. Uh, that is really what they're trying to, to peg. And it's probably more on a risk-adjusted basis as opposed to an, af an after-tax basis. Yeah, but the lower taxes increases the net income of, of the company, which increases the earnings per share which increases the desirability of, of uh, equity investments. Yeah, I'm just saying that the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the history over time, uh, tax cuts really haven't had a major impact on capital investment, on you know, the rate of return. The investors are focused on the rate of return. That's what they want. If they get a tax cut, um, it's really not gonna have an effect on what they're really looking for over the long run. They want a 12.7% rate of return. That's what they're focused on. And that's what the average rate of return has been. So this graph kind of shows kind of the policy and effectiveness associated with tax cuts over the long run. Okay. And then what's the portfolio strategy? Well, again, this is kind of what I was, how am I doing on time? Do you remember CAPM? Yeah. Yeah. Am, I do, am I out of time? Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> how much time do I have? want to know. Where do we put our money? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not making the recommendation. Okay. Um, now, my thesis was that the volatility in asset prices over the last 20 years did not come from the volatility in NOI. That's fairly stable. It came from the discount rate. Volatility in the discount rate. And when you have a Fed that can print $4 trillion and basically buy up uh, sovereign debt and drive down interest rates to zero, um, asset prices are going to go up. Not through NOI but through collapse in basically the cost of capital. So that's where the volatility is coming from. And I do believe that political and policy risk premiums are not even being added into the discount rate or expected returns by most investors. They assume policy and political risk away. They don't see it, because they don't analyze it. Uh, and there's more systematic risk than ever before. The financial crisis basically laid it out. And if you go back in time, there's even more systematic risk. In 95, it was basically the uh, peso crisis. 97, it was the Thai bot. 98, the Russians defaulted. 2000, you had Y2K dot com boom. 2001, you had a recession. You had a housing boom, housing crisis. So there's just more volatility now than ever before and most investors don't even look at. They're looking at returns, but not on a risk adjusted basis based on the volatility. Uh, and then stock market returns. Um, I'm going to skip this. Here's the volatility charts using the VIX index. So the VIX basically collapsed and was really low in 2004 through 7. This is the financial crisis. And then it came down, and now you're seeing more volatility here. There's just more volatility. And what was the stock market down? 500 today. <coughs> it's been up, down, up, down, but in wider, wider uh, springs, or uh, wider ranges. So here's the proxy portfolio. This is not my recommendation. This is just a, 
a, a <laughs> example portfolio, but I do believe that this is the portfolio for the next 30 years, and this is my recommendation to my client. My, not my clients, but my students, because they have 30, 40 years. Okay. So basically what we did is over the, uh, over the decades, we took away from the bonds, and we basically reallocated in the insurance. And now you can get, and you could get uh, cash value life insurance, which is a great diversifier within your portfolio because the cash value accumulates tax-free and it's not even tied to, to anything, so there's no volatility. So if you add a non-volatility, non-correlated asset into your portfolio with stocks and bonds, it's gonna reduce the portfolio standard deviation. Uh, also real estate, which is asset-backed and inflation hedged, <clears throat> because you're, you're putting money into real estate constantly on a capex basis, so you're basically rebuilding your basis in inflation dollars. And in commercial real estate, the CPI is adjusted in your commercial real estate lease contracts. There's a CPI adjustment. Bonds don't have that and stocks don't have that. So real estate is a, an inflationary hedge, which is, has low, no, or negative correlation with stocks and bond returns. So if you add real estate, particularly direct equity real estate into your portfolio, it's gonna lower the overall portfolio standard deviation. The same thing with alternative energy assets. They look and smell a lot like real estate. Um, they have a lot of the same type of contracts in the pr power purchase agreements that are signed over a long period of time. Unfortunately, there's really no private equity exposure and there's really no established uh, high cap, um, publicly traded utility companies in an alternative renewable space. Uh, we had, uh, I thought, when I was working in this area 10 years ago, when basically you had the Kyoto Agreement, you had cap and trade at the federal level, you had AB32 at the state level, and you had community choice aggregation at the local level, that there would be an alignment of policy from global all the way down to local that would basically create a policy conduit to allow for massive capitalization of the alternative renewable energy space. And then a lot of that's been dismantled. And this, is, this area has been disrupted, but I do believe that 10%, 10%, 10%, 25, and 45, this is your target portfolio allocation for the next, uh, I'm telling my students, the next 30 years. And if you stick to the program and you get an 8% or a 10% rate of return, you're gonna double your money in less than 10 years and you'll probably have $4 billion, million in, the, in the bank by the time you're 57 years old, if you do it right. Many of us aren't planning 30 years ahead. <laughs> 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 we are. <laughs> yeah, but your, kid, your kids are. Well, we're planning for adult diapers somewhere in that 30 years. Well, <laughs> again, I'm not, I'm not making any recommendations. Well, but anyway, would you wait for bonds or what? I mean, just well, I'm not making any recommendations, <laughs> okay? But, well, let's uh, say you're over. Let's say but, you're but, I'm a, but I'm a big believer in diversifying the portfolio into a defensive strategy towards uh, consumer products or some kind of uh, consumer-based, you know, ex sector exposures going into a recession. I probably don't want to be in tech because the betas are a lot higher. So I'd probably start to move, particularly in qualified accounts, I'd start moving my money more towards a defensive strategy this late stage in the business cycle, knowing that we'll probably be in a recession within well, the next 12, 12 to 24 months. Hold on. Okay. Then what I would probably do, 